Well, good morning. Good to see everybody today. In my Bible, I've opened the book of Colossians, chapter 3. I'll ask you to do the same. It's where our reading was just a moment ago in the book of Colossians, the third division. While you're opening your Bible and getting settled, welcome. We are happy that you're with us today. If you're visiting with us from another part of the country, welcome. If you're from our neighborhood and just visiting with us today, we welcome you as well. Thank you for coming to be with us this morning. We uh, mentioned the family report that... Uh, um, that Savannah is expecting her baby any day, any, any hour, any minute now. And we also had a note in there that uh, Logan was going to be giving birth to her baby girl tomorrow, be induced. And we didn't know when we wrote that, that Lisa was also going to be induced on Tuesday. So chances are pretty good. We're going to have three new babies in our congregation this week. That's an exciting time with more and more to come. And we're very happy about all of that. It's great to see all of you this morning. I appreciate very much Todd <clears throat> leading the opening song and then the song before the lesson this morning about heaven. I asked him if he would to lead those two songs. I, I think some of the songs about heaven are perhaps some of the finest songs that we, that we have. I wish uh, I, wish I could, could lead those songs for you. I, I've always wanted to lead singing. They, uh, they just won't let me. I've volunteered many times and they, they just won't let me <clears throat> do that. I have an amazing singing voice, by the way. And, um, the, the elders did tell me not long ago that, or at least I heard, they were going to let me uh, uh, sing a solo of the old rugged cross. And I'm kind of excited. Well, they didn't actually tell me that. I did hear one of them say they were only going to let me sing on a hill far away. And so <clears throat> I assume that's what that probably meant, that uh, maybe not. But I appreciate Todd leading those for us as we think about Heaven Bound. That's our theme, of course, in our church family this year. And we have over the beginning months of this year, we have, we've tried to introduce that, introduce that theme. And I want to, uh, before we segue into a different aspect of that, when we get to the month of April, I want to, just wanted to present one more lesson along that line by way of introduction this morning. Several years ago, the group Mercy Me sang the song, I Can Only Imagine. I, that song has resonated with me. I, I love that song very, very much. I wonder, can you do that? Can you imagine? Uh, I've thought about that in regard to a lot of things. I can only imagine about a lot of things that have happened in our world. I can only imagine what it was like 50 years ago in July of this year when Neil Armstrong stood on the surface of the moon and looked back <clears throat> at our little blue planet. I can only imagine what it's like the first time a surgeon cuts open a chest and sees a beating human heart. I can only imagine what it would have been like a century ago or more when, when, a, when a slave held a piece of paper that said that, this, that he was the first individual for as many generations as he could remember in his family, and he was truly, truly free. What would that be? What would that be like? We've been allowed to see a lot of things that we don't have to imagine about anymore. Many of us in this room have We've seen, we've looked into the, the excited eyes of a grandchild. We don't have to imagine what that will be like. We've seen a bride and groom exchange their vows and the excitement of beginning a new life together. Those are amazing things that we've seen. We've seen physical things. Purple mountains, majesty, from sea to shining sea. And we don't have to imagine what that's like anymore because we've seen it with our, with our own eyes. But all of that, all of that pales in comparison to what the Bible says that, for example, John was allowed to see when the Bible said, when Jesus said, when Jesus said, come up here, let me show you some things that are going to be after this. The Apostle Paul would write in Colossians 3, and he would say, I want you to set your mind on things above, things not on this earth. Set your mind where Christ is sitting at the very right hand of God. And he uses an interesting word. He said, I want you to set your mind on that. It's like a pilot, by the way, who sets a course to reach his destination. And Paul's saying, I want you to think about things above. I want you to focus on things above, strive for things above. I want to ask you this morning, do you do that? Can you do that? And when you think about heaven, what, what is it that you think about? In so many ways, we can only imagine. But there are many things that we, in fact, know. A couple of years ago, I presented a lesson on a Sunday morning here, and I, I talked about the, the top 10 things about heaven, heaven's top 10. And I don't want to re-preach that, but I do want to mention those things to you before we make our applications this morning just by way of reminder. I said there, 
There are 10 things about heaven that we all need to, we all need to understand. For example, heaven is a real place. And the Bible talks about it that way. The Bible says, for example, in Matthew 6 and beginning in verse 9, that we should pray, our Father who is in heaven. Jesus said, in my Father's house. And so heaven is God's home. Heaven is not simply a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's not a transitory state. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a galaxy far, far away. The old-time gospel preachers used to say that heaven is a prepared place for the prepared people of God. Heaven is a real place. Secondly, heaven is not like earth. It is not like earth. John was told, I want you to come up here and see because nothing on earth would compare with that. Here we are bothered by so much. We are bothered sometimes by the weather or by bugs in Florida or crime or traffic or politics. But here we take medicine for sickness and we we take naps for our weariness and we secure our houses with alarms and we grieve our losses in cemeteries. But none of that will be in heaven. Behold, God said, I am making everything new. Heaven is not like earth. Third, modern witnesses are bogus. There is a segment of religious publishing that has been extraordinarily popular in the last decade in particular, where individuals claim that they have, they have either died or had near-death experiences, and they have witnessed heaven, and they've come back, and now they've written books to tell us what all that is going to be like and what it's going to be about. I've got to tell you, I find that amazing, because in 2 Corinthians 12, there's an inspired apostle who says that he was allowed to see and glimpse and experience some things about heaven, and he said, I saw things that were inexpressible. And what was expressible, he said, it is not lawful for me to say. And yet these individuals claim that they can come back and they, are, they can just chat about it and write about it. And Paul says, no, what you see there, much of it, a human mind cannot even begin to comprehend as yet. If you want to know what heaven is like, don't read a book by somebody who's trying to line their pockets. Open your Bible and read what the Bible has to say. Number four, not everybody goes to heaven. I know that's not, I know that's not politically correct to say. I know that it's not, it's not popular to say in 21st century America. I mean, after all, we, we live in a, in, in a world where everybody gets a trophy and everybody gets a snow cone. Everybody's all right. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay with God. But Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, you are my Lord. Not everybody who says that is going to go to heaven. He said, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. What that says to me is that it really doesn't matter what a preacher says at a funeral about whether or not somebody goes to heaven. What matters is the choices that we make and the lives that we live now. Fifth, we don't become angels. When you die, you don't become an angel. Angels are amazing beings. They have an amazing job to do. Hebrews 1 and verse 14, they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those of us who are the heirs of salvation. You were made in the image of God, the Bible says. Angels were not. And when you die, you don't simply become an angel. But sixth, you will still be you. That's an important consideration. You will still be you in heaven. The question is always raised, will we have recognition, will we know each other in heaven. Now, I know people who are on both sides of that equation. I've got some some friends who are on the yes side of that and some are on the no side of that. Personally, I am firmly on the yes side of that question. I believe absolutely unequivocally that we will know each other in heaven. I believe that for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that in 1 Thessalonians 2 and beginning of verse 9, the Apostle Paul said, what is our hope and what is our joy and what is our crown? Is it not even you in the presence of Jesus Christ when he comes again? And the point of that is that he says, you will be you. When the Lord comes again and we meet the Lord in the air, you will be you. I mean, what's the point if we're going to be surrounded by strangers? And I know somebody says, I I can almost hear somebody saying this, yes, Don, but won't we miss people who aren't there? I got to tell you, I don't know the answer to that and I don't worry about that because there's anything too hard for God. Don't you believe that God can work that out? but I believe that you will be you. There's a reason why Paul said you can comfort each other with these words about eternity. Number seven, you will, however, be different. I know that's true because Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 said, we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of the eye at the last trump. We will be changed. So what will we look like? What will our resurrected body be? I don't really know. All I know is 1 John 3 and beginning of verse 2, John said, it does not yet appear 
what we shall be. All we can know, he said, is that we will be like him. We will be resurrected, never to die again. You're never going to need glasses again. You won't need a hearing aid again. You won't need a cane or a walker again. I am pretty sure that all men are going to have very distinguished looking mustaches, but beyond that, we really don't know. It does not yet appear what we shall be. And then time shall be no more. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And really, I think what that means is that the pressures of time will be no more. I realize that the elements that demark time, sun and moon, won't be in existence anymore. But if time really is just moving from one thing to another, we are going to be active in heaven, but the pressures of time will be no more. There'll be no more running late, no more rushing to be somewhere, no more checking the clock, no more being worried about the calendar and how we're going to do things. And number nine, we won't be tempted anymore. I know that's true because Revelation 20 and 10 says that our adversary, the devil, is going to be cast into the lake of fire, which burns with, with fire and brimstone. And so where we are going to be with God in heaven, the devil will not be. And so that means that there'll be no more temptation. We'll not be tempted anymore. No more deception. No more sin. And then tenth and finally, I don't think we're going to miss our old lives. I don't think that we will miss our old lives on earth. The Apostle Paul, Philippians 1 and verse 23 said, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which would be far better. One translation says, exceedingly far better. Literally, it is very much far better. And so whatever we enjoy in this life, and God gives us much to enjoy, no denying that, but I don't think we're going to miss this life because in every way, God is making a provision that is going to be for us very much far better. Every negative thing to which you've been exposed in this world Maybe that sickness, and we talked about some of that in the family report this morning for some of the people in our church family. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a bad thing in your personal life, your interpersonal interactions with others, or maybe just what we see on the evening news. None of that will be in heaven. No wonder the song says, I can only imagine. But we don't have to imagine about those things. I think those 10 things are true. And what I want to do in the minutes that we have left this morning, ladies and gentlemen, is talk to you about three additional things that we don't have to imagine. That the Bible says, look, for the people of God, here's what I want you to know about heaven. Let me share those three things with you very quickly this morning. The lesson's yours. Here we go. Number one, when the curtain is drawn back and John is allowed in Revelation 4, is told by Jesus, come up here. I want to show you some things that are going to be hereafter. The very first thing that he sees is Revelation 4. And the very first thing that he sees is that God is in heaven and God is on his throne. That evidently is of very first importance. And what John sees is this, that the, that the creation says, you are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things, and by your will they were created, and they have their very being. The very first thing that John sees is that heaven is a city of God. We sing about that wonderful city of God, that that's where God is. It's where Jesus is. Chapter 5. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Here's the point of that. We have spent a lifetime. We have spent a lifetime. Those of us who grew up in this fellowship, those of us who on Sundays have worshiped God for the entirety of our lives, we have spent a lifetime praying to God, singing to God, talking about God, converting the lost to God, bowing our heads before God, following God. But in heaven, we get to actually be with God. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms. Salvation belongs to God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And where God is, we can be as well. In my Father's house, Jesus said, there are many rooms. That's the essence of heaven, by the way. The essence of heaven is that God and Jesus are there. The essence of heaven is not a gate of pearl. It is not a street of gold. It's none of those physical kinds of things that the Spirit used to try, to try to convey to a human mind some understanding or apprehension of what heaven might be. The heaven is the presence of God and Jesus. And could I say to you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, if that doesn't mean very much to you now, it probably wouldn't mean very much to you in heaven. 
In Revelation chapter 22, John said, The throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. His servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And so when John is talking about all this, and he's trying to, he's trying to process everything that he's seen, he says, when you see the throne of God, one of the things that impresses you is that you get to see the very face of God. If you're married as I am and have been married for a long time, can you remember back? Can you remember back at your wedding when you looked down an aisle and you saw, you saw your bride in her wedding dress for the very first time? Or can you remember the very first time that you looked into the face of your firstborn child. John says when you, when you see the face of someone for the first time, it's a special thing. Job said, I will see God my eyes and not another. When John writes about that, by the way, at the end of the book of Revelation, in chapter 21 in verse 22, he said the great thing is that there's no temple in heaven. The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. We, we talked a few weeks ago on a, on a Sunday morning, I, I think it was lecture Sunday morning, we talked about the fact that that represents the fact that there's no separation between us and God in, in heaven. There's no temple there. To a Jewish mind, everybody understood what that would mean because the temple represented the presence of God. God dwelt, as it were, in the holy of holies. But the temple, while it also represented the presence of God, it also represented separation from God. Because there were multiple courtyards in the temple, and each of those those told you how close you could get to God. And so the Gentiles couldn't go beyond the court of the Gentiles, and women could not go beyond the court of women. The average Jew could not go into the holy place, and even the average priest could not go into the holy of holies. And the unclean could not enter the compound at all, and a Samaritan, he couldn't even get to the temple mount. And so everything in the temple, even though it represented the presence of God, everything in the temple said something to you about how close you could get to God. But in heaven, there is no separation between man and God. And so in heaven, you get to be with God, not just for a moment. And it's not like I've been in several settings where where I was going to be allowed to to meet somebody who was a a sports celebrity or a political celebrity, and I've stood in the line, and I've, I've been able to stand up there, and I get to shake their hand, to look at the camera, and they take my picture, and in 10 seconds, it's over, and I moved on. You know, it's not that way with God. You get to be with him forever. That's the essence of heaven. Let me say that again. If that doesn't mean much to you now, it won't mean much to you then. I've often thought that the, that the sermons that were preached in days past about why you ought to worship God and attendance and all of that, often look at that from a very wrong-headed perspective. I mean, if it's not important for you to be with God and with God's people now, What makes you think that you would enjoy that in heaven? In fact, let's just talk about that for a second. We have sung for generations in our churches this great old hymn, When We All All Get to Heaven. We sang it just a moment ago. It's a great thought, isn't it? In in Revelation chapter 7, after these things I looked, John says, and behold, there there was a great multitude which no one could number. And they were of all nations and tribes, and peoples and tongues, and they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, and they were clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands. I want you to think about that, that when John looks at this, this, this scene in heaven, not only is it that God is there and Jesus is there, but, but he says that there's a, there's a crowd there that, that you can't number. And he said they are people from the length and breadth of this gro- globe. They are of every nation, in every language, in every race, because there's no respected persons with God. If there's respected persons with you, if you look at somebody of another race or of another nation, another tongue, and you believe that they are inferior to you, you don't want anything to do with them now. What makes you think that you could live with them in heaven? 
The Bible says repeatedly there is no respect of persons with God. And so here, godly people, simple people, famous people, unknown people, rich people, poor people, but the common thread is that they walk by faith and obedience before God. These are people that when Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and you shall love your neighbor just like you love yourself, they took it seriously, and that's what they did. The Hebrew writer said, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. You have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. You've come to the church of the firstborn ones whose names are written in heaven. I got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I think sometimes we're going to be, I think we'll probably be surprised. I think we'll probably be surprised by some folks who are in heaven and probably be surprised by some who are not there. But John says, you know what? I I stood and I saw people who served. They all had a past, but they served God in their present. And now they live with God in their future. John says, I stood among people who had been redeemed by the grace of God. People who had fought a good fight and finished the course and kept the faith. And again, ladies and gentlemen, if being with the people of God doesn't mean much to you now, It probably won't mean much to you then. John was told in Revelation 4, 1, come up here. I want to show you some things that must take place after this. And again, I think the reason that John was told you've got to come up here is because there's no comparison with what you're going to see up here with what you've experienced on earth. I want you to think about that with me as we begin to draw this to a conclusion this morning. The imagery that is given in the book of Revelation about heaven, I think in so many ways is designed to say clearly, graphically, vividly, that nothing on earth compares with heaven. Now the earth that God gave us is an amazing place. I I gotta tell you, God was so good to give us the earth that he did. I mean, he could, have made, he could have made the earth just entirely flat. He could have made it completely brown. He could have put no variety in nature whatsoever. But he gave us a beautiful earth. I have been so blessed, ladies and gentlemen. I have seen the Atlantic. I've seen the Pacific. I have seen the Mediterranean. I've seen the Aegean. I have seen the, I've seen the Rockies and I've seen the Alps. I've seen the White House, I've seen the Kremlin, I have seen the castles of Europe and the Temple Mound in Jerusalem, but I will tell you that there is nothing on this earth that begins to compare with what John saw in heaven and what we will one day see. When I think about it, I think about Deuteronomy 3. In Deuteronomy 3, Moses, Moses is, he gathers his children, the children of Israel, And he gathers them for a series of speeches. He's like a dad who knows he's going to die. And so he gathers his kids and he talks about what he wants them to understand before he goes. But before he gives the speeches, he tells about an encounter that he had with God. And he said, I asked God, when God told me, you're not going to be allowed to go into the land, he said, I asked God to please let me do that. And he said, I ask him again, and I ask him again. I ask him, he said, I ask him so many times that finally God said, no more. Don't ask me again. But he said, God said, I'll give you a glimpse. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the creator of Canaan giving you a tour of Canaan? Can you imagine what he, <clears throat> what he must have said to Moses? Moses. Look over, here, look over here to the north, and you, you see those hills, and you see, you see that stream? That, that's going to be the stream that will provide for your children. But he said, you can't have it. It won't be yours. But by faith, Moses could take what he could see and he could envision what would be for the future. 
The songs that we sing that we mentioned at the beginning, it, it reflects that, I think, in our hearts. We, we have sung for generations in our churches songs like, on Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a, a wishful eye. We have sung, oh, they tell me of a home over there. We sing this song, wonderful city of God or home of the soul. We sing a song that asks, won't it be wonderful there? You know what I've wondered, ladies and gentlemen, was when John, when he was given that revelation on the Lord's Day that he wrote for us, that we read as the book of Revelation, I've wondered what it was like for John when the vision began to fade and he realized the vision is over and now he's back to real life on earth. You've got to know that what he saw inspired him for the future, which is what it's designed to do for us. For the past several years, <clears throat> for the past several years, I've gone to Alabama to MC a, a charitable banquet that raises funds for a foundation for a relative of mine who passed away a few years ago. And they have a, they have a guest speaker every year, and two or three years ago, the guest speaker was Sean Alexander. Sean Alexander, of course, was a star running back at the University of Alabama, and then he had a long career, particularly with the Seattle. He had a Hall of Fame career. And he was a fascinating man to talk to. I got to sit at the table with him as we ate, ate our meal, and I got to visit with him a little bit. But, but during, the, during his speech that night, he talked about what faith means to him. And he talked about how faith has been the guiding principle of his life. And he said, I got that from my grandmother. And I'll never forget, he talked about his grandmother when his grandmother was dying, and he said he traveled to go see her just before she died. And he, and he told her, he said, I'm, he said, I'm so sorry. And here's what his grandmother told him. She said, don't be sorry. She said, quote, I know who I am, whose I am and where I'm going. Can you say that this morning? Because I tell you, if you can say those three things, everything's okay with you. We should all be able to close our eyes and exit this world with those thoughts in our mind that we know who we are, that we are sinners who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we know then whose we are. Because we were redeemed, it means we belong to him. And because of that, what did Paul say? We have an inheritance. We know where we're going. It's one thing to know there's a hope out there. It's another thing to be able to sing, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. You have that hope this morning. And so, in the words of our theme for this year in our church family, are you, in fact, this morning, heaven bound? We also sing in our churches a song that simply asks, don't you want to go to that land? If that's you this morning, and you know, you know that things are not right with you and your God, and whether that means that you need to be baptized into Christ or whether you need to come home to him today, don't leave this building until you are able to say, I know who I am and whose I am, and I know where I'm going. And so if there's a response you need to make to God today in a public way, and we can help you, we hope you'll let us. Let's stand. Let's sing. So